everyone, welcome back to the shop. We're finishing up on our off-grid power system. I wanted to go through the components that we have here and uh, we're gonna put those in the description below so that you guys can find those parts easily. They're also gonna be in our DIY van build cheat sheet. If you haven't heard about the DIY van build cheat sheet, it's a curated list of all the items that I purchased on Amazon over the past three years. So all the items you see here, tools, fuse holders, hydraulic crimpers, all those items are on there. You can use that to not only help yourself save time and money, but also help the channel. So check out the link in the description below for the van build cheat sheet. You can also find it on vanbuilderhq.com. All right, we're over here on our off-grid power system. And really the only thing we have left is we have one more lug that's gonna go on the end. I'm gonna show you exactly how I cut, crimp this, and then do my heat shrink. So we'll have just like a mini tutorial at the end of this video. So look forward to that. Uh, but let's go ahead and really kick it off and uh, show you what we got here. If you've been following in the previous live stream, we've gone into detail about building the 80-20 frame, what components we've used for that, uh, the battery system, the inverter, distribution block from Victron, and then our DC to DC chargers by Renogy. I created this system so that we could support the Dometic RTX 2000 AC unit. So that's a 12 volt AC unit. It's a rooftop mounted. Uh, it's a very efficient unit. But when you're building a system like this, you really want to capitalize on battery power. So instead of like a traditional maybe 400 amp hours, uh, we bumped it up to 600 amp hours. And that's gonna give us enough headroom to actually enjoy the time that we have with the van be able to use the components in the van, such as water heater for hot water, our inverter, microwave, parking heater, interior lights, being able to charge our devices. And then at the same time, we'll have enough battery bank left to enjoy using the AC uh, for the evening um, and possibly for a couple days. So in a future video, we're gonna be taking this system and we'll be doing an in-house test of how long we can power the Dometic RTX 2000 with this off-grid system. Uh, that way you guys can get some real world numbers on what we can do with a, with a setup like this. One thing I like to do when I build vans is keep everything as compact as possible. Space is just such a luxury in a van that you really need to maximize uh, utilizing the space very effectively. One van that we did for a customer, Thomas, that's our Marine One van. We use that van uh, as a good example because we had a structured, we had a structured set of uh, space that we needed to use in the van that couldn't be taken up by anything else. So that was to allow for his paragolfer, which is his electric wheelchair uh, that allowed him to go in and out of the van. Because that space was already spoken for, our power system and our water setup had to be extremely minimal, but at the same time have enough capacity so that he could operate everything in his van. So we achieved that with his van. This van has another purpose. His van did not have an air conditioning unit. This van does. So sticking with the theme of keeping everything nice and compact, this off-grid power system is only as wide as the individual batteries themselves. The length begins at the kitchen galley and extends to the back of the van. So we have a total length here. Let's get a tape measure out. So you guys can get an idea. We've got 65 inches. Uh, so that's our maximum length on the power system. If we come up here, we have the width of the power system, which is the width of our batteries. It's 11 and a quarter. And we're gonna be adding three quarters more distance. Uh, and that's gonna be able to take care of our three quarter inch panel that's gonna be covering the batteries. So once we have all that into place, that's pretty much our setup. Now our height is uh, designated aesthetically. So there's a natural curve in the bump outs of the Ford Transit. And we've meet, we're meeting that curve from the top and coming down to the bottom. So our height of our power system is 21 and a half inches. Uh, with our half inch plywood that's going to cap it on top, we got 22 inches high. So if you're interested in the form and function, um, that's kind of what we're working with. There's two other notable dimensions in here. 
One is this chamber underneath here, which is where we have our uh, Webasto parking heater that is going to go under here. And then behind the two Renogy DC to DC MPPT charge controllers, this is our wheel well. So our wheel well begins here, comes up, goes around, and then tapers off about right in this area, right before our inverter. So we're really maximizing the space. Uh, believe it or not, we only are using uh, four inches of depth with our DC to DC and MPPT charge controllers. Now I keep saying those words together because these are dual units. So these Renogy 50 amp charge controllers will, also, will do DC to DC as well as uh, they're a solar charge controller and it's the MPPT uh, version of that. So we got dual chargers here. Um, one, we want to have the maximum charging capacity. So we have 50 amps each with a max of 100 amps pulling from the engine alternator. Um, but what's also nice is we have some redundancy. So in extreme situation where one of these fails, we have a redundant backup. So you're still gonna get charging. You're still gonna get charging from your, uh, not only your alternator, but your engine as well. This inverter is extremely big. <laughs> it's a 3000 watt, but it's an inverter charger, which makes it very heavy. It's about 65 pounds. This unit is the new Renogy Rego. <clears throat> It's a pure sine wave inverter and charger. So what we can do is we can charge the power system. Uh, we can use it and we can top it off off of shore power. We can take our batteries, we can invert it to 120 volts for our household appliances that we have in the van. Um, everything from our induction stove, our microwave, our hot water heater. And then uh, we have 3,000 watt capacity, and that has to do with the livability. You may hear me talk about that a lot in our live streams. If you can imagine, you know, you're at home, not in a van, and you want to heat something up in the microwave, you want to wash your hands with hot water, um, and then you also want to maybe get on your laptop or uh, do some other activity, but you want to do all this at the same time. So if you have a 1,000 watt microwave, you have a 1,200 watt induction stove, and maybe you know, you're pulling a couple hundred watts, uh, maybe charging something, maybe a battery brick or something like that, then you really are starting to use up this 3,000 watts. But since you have that headroom, you're able to enjoy all those devices being powered at the same time. So that's a lot of t reasons why people go from like a 2,000 watt inverter up to a 3,000 watt inverter. It's just so you can do multiple devices at the same time, not necessarily that you're trying to power something that's 3,000 watts. So that's the Renji Rego. You may have seen in an old video where we have the same inverter. It's not Rego. So what Rego stands for is that it's Renji's new uh, inverter that has a Bluetooth uh, has Bluetooth integration built into it. And we'll talk about Bluetooth here in just a second because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be linking all of uh, the six 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate smart batteries. So these are Renogy smart batteries. Three of these are self-heating and three are not. These will be plugged into a uh, hub, which is right over here. The DC to DC chargers over here will also be plugged into this hub. And this communication hub is how this whole system is going to communicate uh, with the Renogy One controller. So we got the Renogy One controller over there. I'm going to grab it here in a second um, to give you guys an example. But this hub uses uh, essentially network cables. So just like your Ethernet cable. These uh, DC to DC chargers, they do come with one cable each. So these will be easily plugged up. The batteries do not come with any cable, so you'll have to get that. Uh, but you have eight ports on here on the hub. And so we have six batteries and then we have two DC to DC charge controllers. So those will all populate this whole entire hub. Once this is completely populated, we'll take our hub and the way that these devices link to the Renogy One system is with this uh, BT2 module. Now think about this, this has this module built into it. So you don't need a Bluetooth adapter for this. Uh, that's why we upgraded to the Rego versus our other one. 
Um, also, the other one's not compatible, so that makes sense. <laughs> but the blue BT2 connector is gonna go into the primary spot. And now everything that's plugged into this hub will be able to communicate to the Renogy 1 controller um, by Bluetooth. So this will take care of our batteries, our two DC to DC chargers. This will also connect with its internal Bluetooth connection. And then I'm just gonna go grab the box uh, for the Renogy 1 just so you guys can see. So here's the Renogy 1 controller. And what I really liked about this is uh, this system allows you to download the Renogy app and you're able to extensively monitor all of these sources. Um, you get so much information that uh, it's almost overwhelming, like diving into the menu. If you want to get uh, kind of nerdy and dive into the menu, you can go very deep. You can find out the individual cells on these batteries and their voltages. Um, for the normal user, you're not going to worry about that. You're really just going to worry about the state of charge. Are these full? Are these empty? Um, it does that as well. So if we open this up, and they have very nice packaging. It feels almost kind of like a, you know, Apple unboxing. Um, but this is the controller, and I was surprised when I first got this controller because uh, I thought it was going to be much bigger than it was. So if you can imagine, this is a, a battery. You know, it's very, it's extremely tiny. But we have a uh, display right here. And then we have three switches, so you can have this orientation or you have this orientation. We'll probably do this uh, orientation in the van. Um, these are switches, so you get three switches here. So once everything is connected via Bluetooth to this system, now you can do it via Bluetooth, um, but then it also has the uh, Ethernet port back here in the back. Technically, uh, this is the RS-45 port. So you'll plug this in if you don't want to do the Bluetooth. So you could just plug a cable up directly from the hub to this. Uh, secondly, you have the type C and this positive and negative port over here on the left. So if you have a type C cable that's already powered, you can plug that in. Or if you want to hardwire it right here, you can do that as well. This is what's really cool. Once you set this all up, connect the Bluetooth or add the cable. You can see we have these uh, six uh, connections up here. So each one is a positive and negative. And what we have up here is uh, these are what are going to control. Um, let me take that back. So not positive and negative. These are just the control ports. So for example, if you want these switches to activate the lights in your van, maybe you have an exterior light and then you want another one to connect to your water pump, um, you can do that via these uh, three switch ports. So there's a wire in, wire out, in, out, in, out. So there's three of them. Now once you set this up, uh, this can now be also triggered by your phone. So if you're in the app, you can turn the lights off in your van if you hop into bed. You can turn your water pump on if you forgot, stuff like that. Um, there is a subscription plan for a more advanced version uh, that allows you to change some things on here, but then also monitor your system wireless, wirelessly. Uh, we're not going to do that, but you do have the option to do that if you'd like to. Uh, but pretty much in a nutshell, that is the Renogy 1 controller. We're going to have future videos diving into this, you know, the menus, how this whole entire thing is set up. But really, this is just kind of get you guys caught up with what's happening in the shop. So let's go ahead and put this back in the box. And we are gonna continue with the uh, off-grid power system tour. So once we have this in the van, we have all of our batteries connected and these systems here, uh, the next question you may ask is, how does everything work? So besides it being connected to the system, um, where are the other devices connecting? So, for example, our alternator hookup, um, our battery shunt to monitor the power in and out, and then lastly, the uh, solar disconnect in the back that's bringing in our solar power. So we'll start where the power comes in first. So we're using the Renogy 50 amp 
DC to DC with MPPT controller combo unit right here. And if you're looking at this unit, we have uh, four terminals here. This terminal right here that's not connected will be connected to the engine batteries. Um, so that's where the alternator charging current is going to come from. So that comes into here. On the back side, we have our solar input, and that is controlled. We have a breaker, a dual pole breaker, and we have two of these because we're going to have two uh, systems up on top. We're going to have one set of uh, solar charging that's going to be 400 watts, and then we'll have a supplemental uh, that will probably be around the 200 watt range. So we're hoping to get about 600 watts on the roof. So that's going to come in through these dual pole breakers. Dual pole breakers are important for a solar charging system because although you may have an inline fuse on top of your van, uh, this breaker is going to protect you if you have uh, current back feeding through uh, the negative side of the wire. So for example, if you just had the positive fused and it blows, it's possible, depending on what damage occurred, uh, or what shorted on your roof for it to come and feed back through the negative. So what's nice is dual poles protect both of the poles at the same time. However, you can't have separate breakers because that would, you know, not do its job. So if you have a dual pole, dual throw breaker, if either the negative or positive fails, it's going to trip. Um, this is also very convenient when you're doing maintenance. So for example, say you needed to do a hard reset of your power system. If you disconnect your battery disconnect in the back, so we also have a battery disconnect that disconnects the power from our batteries going into our uh, Lynx distributor here. If you cut this off, you can see if we have solar uh, still coming in, it's still gonna feed a small amount of power into our system. So that, depending on the size of your solar bank um, or solar array on top of your roof, you could have enough power to where I don't, you know, parts of your van are still operating because the, now they may be like low voltage. So if you use this breaker, you can uh, make sure that you disconnect it 100% and you don't have anything additionally feeding. So if you ever need to fully work on your system, you can turn your system off from your battery disconnect, and then you can just flip this breaker, uh, and then you'll be safe to work on your system, and not worry about shorting anything out. So these two components, again, they're on our DIY van build cheat sheet, so we'll reference these if you're interested in getting these products. So after we have our uh, solar come in, so we have our engine charging, then we have our solar. Solar is coming in, it's being controlled by our disconnect box right here. So now we're moving on to how this box works. So if we're getting power from our engine battery, this is converting it to a chargeable voltage for our uh, batteries. And there's a uh, different profiles. So there's a little button here and you're going to select and cycle through that. And that's going to go from if you had a sealed lead acid, uh, AGM, or like a lithium iron phosphate battery, you'll select this. Um, it'll let you know that you've selected whatever chemistry you're working with. And then this controller will take your engine batteries, which are typically, you know, lead acid or AGM, and then convert that to a charge profile that matches your lithium iron phosphate batteries, which comes out here. This goes into your Lynx distributor and that will charge your batteries. And it's just copied over here. So you'll have two charges going in. And then each one is, has the common negative right here. So we have a negative here, a negative here, and those negatives are going to be put into our, uh, the chassis ground at the back of the van. So at the back of a Ford Transit, you'll have these three terminals that they use to ground the tail lights and some other things. Uh, so we're gonna pull off of that. We'll have a terminal stud in the back and then that's how we will actually feed uh, and ground all of our negative wires. 
So now that we have power from this going into our system, we need to manage that, and we're going to be managing that with a Victron Lynx distributor. Um, it's always nice to get a little bit of Victron components in your van. And this is what it looks like. You guys uh, have probably seen this in some other vans. Um, but this is the Lynx distributor. Um, it's kind of pricey. It's, you know, I guess technically like a glorified bus bar, but we love it because it is exactly that. It's, it's one place. It's a system to where everything is ready to go. Um, it's very robust. Uh, it can take a lot of current. So a thousand references the, the amps or the amount of current that it can withstand or that it's rated for. And if you want to have these lights activated, um, since we don't have any other Victron components that activate the lights, uh, Explorers.Live has a great video where he shows you how to wire the inside of this to have these lights active. And what these lights do is they essentially alert you when a fuse is blown and they'll tell you what fuse is blown. Uh, but back to the uh, kind of robustness of this system. I like it because it's very simple, easy to understand, and you can locate it somewhere where if one of your fuses blows, it's very easy to get to. So up here, we'll have our positive end, and this is our negative, our ground for our system. And this is how our power comes into this system. This big, chunky red uh, positive cable, this is actually our battery disconnect that goes to the back. So for example, we have a sliding tray that goes right here. So if you had this packed up to the gills, you know, you wouldn't be able to access this. So all of our access and breakers are on the back so you can quickly get to it in the event of emergency uh, or just general maintenance. So right here, we left off with the power coming in from these controllers. So they come in here and then we have this fuse uh, with a 60 amp fuse. So this fuse is rated to protect the wire coming out. So that protects that. And then this power is going into our Lynx distributor. And once this goes in, it has the ability to charge our batteries. So you can actually think of it as coming through this top bar, coming down through the disconnect back into the battery system. Now, one thing to note that we'll talk about later is we will be taking a, a negative cable from the back of the batteries all the way to the front. And you may be wondering why we have such a long run. So what we want to do is anytime you wire batteries together, you want to have the same length uh, in the uh, supplying as well as um, so the power going in and out. So what we do is we're going to take this length of cable here and then we'll re replicate that. I've already measured these two and then we'll have a negative line going from the very back all the way to uh, our shunt here. And our shunt is going to be what allows us to monitor our power in and our power out. Uh, that's how we ca calculate our uh, battery state of charge. Um, as well as consumption as well. And although the Renji 1, because of the smart lithium batteries, is going to tell us our state of charge, uh, we wanted to have a redundant system. Um, so this was just a way to quickly glance and see the power coming in and out. So that is how the power is coming in from the batteries and being charged from the DC to DC charge controller here. Uh, the next step is what about our other items that are consuming the power? So once we have these two items charging it, so we have our alternator charging and our solar charging, we have another way of charging it, and that's via shore power, via our inverter charger. So our inverter charger is going to have a shore power plug going outside of the van. So if you wanted to, if you're at your house, a friend's house, or you're at an RV site, you'd be able to top off these batteries uh, at nighttime or just any time you wanted to top them off. Uh, and you wouldn't have to run the car, I mean, you wouldn't have to run the van, and you wouldn't have to worry about um, the sun being out, for example. So that's the nice thing about the inverter charger. So with this inverter charger, uh, not only can we charge the batteries, but this is what we're gonna 
use to power 120 volt devices, as we said earlier. And right here is how this unit gets powered. So this unit takes a lot of current, um, especially if you are running multiple devices. And this thing has a max current draw of up to 300 amps. So we have it fused at 300 amps. Um, it will be very challenging to hit that number. So 300 amps is a ton of current. So you're typically not going to get anything close to that. But just in case, that is the recommended fuse for the inverter. So you can kind of see 300 amps is the max. And we have our 1,000 amp capacity. So don't forget that. So from that 1,000, you can start ticking away at your reserves. So for example, you know, after the 300, you get about 700 amps left. So where is that going to go? Well, we have 700. Next, we have our RTX, Dometic RTX 2000 rooftop AC unit. Uh, the manufacturer recommends an 80 amp fuse to protecting that circuit. And uh, just to do simple math, you know, we bring it down 80, let's just say 100. So we got about 600 amps left. And our last device is this right here. So this is a terminal fuse, and it's a pretty cool hack. So I found this, I learned about this also from Explorers.life. And if you notice this cover, we have this little terminal stud coming out. And why do we need this? Well, this is an easy way to add one more fused circuit coming out of the Lynx distributor. We're going to use this for our uh, remote fuse block. And this is what it looks like. So as you can see, all of our major components are handled by the Lynx distributor. You know, our DC to DC charging, our inverter, and our Dometic RTX 2000, so our big current draws are protected by these big chunky mega fuses. This one, we have, uh, so we did our quick math, we got about 600 amps left over. So we have this, which is a 500 amp, uh, this is a 100 amp terminal fuse. And so that brings us down to 500. So you see, we're only using half the capacity, even though we have these high current items, we're only using about half the capacity of this Lynx distributor. So it's a very robust unit. But what we're powering with this 100 amp circuit here is we are powering this uh, ST blade fuse block. So blade fuses, uh, you guys have probably seen them um, mostly from automotive. So, you know, if you've ever replaced like your taillight fuse or something like that, it's probably a blade fuse. And that's just a fuse that just inserts like a blade, just like it says. All the components uh, that I use other than this, like the Lynx distributor or some of these components are nine times out of 10 gonna be a Blue Sea Systems component. So the battery disconnects are Blue Sea Systems. Um, and then any fuses are Blue Sea Systems. Uh, the ST blade fuse block that we're about to talk about. Um, but what's nice is this block can support up to 100 amps. So we have a 100 amp block, 100 amp fuse. So now we just kind of start uh, ticking away on our usages. So this block is going to be conveni conveniently located underneath our kitchen galley. And this is going to take care of uh, all of our overhead lights, any exterior lights we have, our parking heater, our fridge, um, our water pump, USB charging outlets, anything 12 volt like that. We'll be out of here. Uh, but what's nice about this is if you supply it with such a high current, then uh, the future customer can add whatever additional things that they want to, and they won't be limited by the current. So if you can go nice, on, nice and high on current here, you know, 100 amps, you're going to have a lot of devices that you're going to be able to use, um, not only simultaneously, but uh, future expansions will be really easy. You're going to be able to tap into this. One thing to note about these blade fuse blocks is some are sold without a negative uh, grounding port. And that may be fine depending on your wiring situation, but in my experience, it's very aggravating to have to pull the negative uh, or make a negative connection uh, outside of a fuse block. So when you're buying these 
fuse blocks two things. Make sure that it has a negative terminal and make sure it has a plastic snap-on cover just to protect it from anything that might rub up against it. Uh, so with this one, what's nice is you have your negative terminals up here and then you have your positive terminals over here. So if you have a new wire that you wanted to put in, like a USB charger outlet, you can just take that positive negative, wire it right here to the side, add your blade fuse, and you have your new circuit. Very, very easy. So that is where this uh, terminal is going. Then to finish up on the back, we talked about our disconnect. So we have a Blue Sea Systems disconnect, and they're typically in red, but we got this one in black because we're uh, trying to keep everything nice and sleek, kind of color uh, coded is for, um, not color coded, but aesthetically, you know, we want, <laughs> we want it to look good. Um, so this one is black. We also have uh, this box. They do make a gray one if you're looking for gray. So they've got red, gray, and black. So we only have two connections back here. We have this is our main connection. Uh, now again, you need to make sure that these things are rated for uh, the, the maximum current that you, um, you may see uh, at one time. So for example, this is a also, again, any of these products, you really want to make sure that they're UL listed or try to get as many UL listed items in your van just for safety. But for this, we have 300 amps continuous, uh, 450 amp spike for five minutes, and then we got 675 amps for 30 seconds. So we're not going to hit any of these numbers because uh, these fuses will blow before this ever gets interrupted. So just for sizing purposes, that's a good thing to look forward to. Um, and then last but not least, in the back here, we have our solar disconnect box. This box, uh, if you go and look at our van build cheat sheet, you'll be able to find this box. This box is nice because uh, it is uh, splash proof, so it has these gaskets. And what's nice about this is, um, for example, in Thomas's van, this is mounted inside his battery system, and there's no way for water or rain from the back doors being opened to get to it. So this was just mount mounted on its clip and just for easy access and maintenance. However, this, uh, as you guys can see, we don't have any room to put this box. So we are putting this box in the very back, and that's a, one to th something to think about when you have all these components is where you're going to put them. So this layout, we have this box in the very back, and you can imagine if the doors were open and it was storming one day, um, we have our disconnect switch protected, but we need to protect this. So what this box does is we have our disconnects. There's these little plastic tabs you can break out. So it comes with one opening, uh, but since we have two battery uh, solar panel arrays, we're going to have two of these disconnects. They're all, they're rated for how much ever, you know, how much power you anticipate coming in. So uh, we have one for 32 amps and then the other one I believe is 16 amps, but we have two side by side. This cover comes over, pops in, and this is now nice and protected. So that is part of the back. Next, we're gonna talk about the tools here uh, and then we're going to do that in prep for the end of this video where we're going to do a quick tutorial on how to strip, uh, cut, crimp, cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink <laughs> this wire. This wire, that's a tongue twister. All right, let's check out the tools that we have here. Again, all these tools are on the DIY Van Bell cheat sheet. Check out the link in the description below. So let's go ahead and take off the table the items that we're not talking about. Uh, before I forget, this was not mentioned. The alternator charging, we, I'm using these as uh, safety fuse blocks, and we're going to be using two of these. And these will be the two fuse blocks from each of the engine batteries. So we have a dual battery set up in the Ford Transit. So one will be attached to one battery, one will be attached to the other battery. They're both going to be six gauge wires coming back to this unit. And so this will be the uh, point uh, that is protecting the power cable 
or the 12 volt line going from the engine battery to the DC to DC charge controller. What's nice about these Blue Sea system safety blocks is they have a nice, uh, they're actually designated for the engine bay of a, a boat, but they have a gasket here. It snaps over to there. The wires are protected. And then these yellow clips are really nice because it's a very satisfying click to shut this top. Um, some other lower cost uh, fuse blocks like this, um, I don't like them because I've, I've found uh, issues with them. Um, so they're typically sold for like car stereos. Uh, if I were you, the, um, just for peace of mind, definitely get this system. Um, it uses a mega fuse, which is really nice because it'll be the same type of fuse like this. And if you had the same type of fuse, it's just more convenient to have these fuses. You're used to them. You know that this fuse is the same as this fuse. All you need to do is change the amperage. Uh, and this will be underneath your driver's seat. So we'll have two of these. All right, let's talk about tools for crimping and making all these connections. So first, we need to have our power cable. So our power cable, um, I get it from a company called Windy Nation. Uh, Again, these are all in the Van Builder HQ DIY Van Builder cheat sheet. So you can buy these, you buy them in lengths of 10, 10 feet, 25 feet, 100. Um, however, you will find that 4 aught, which is a very chunky wire, is ex very expensive. So 10 feet of red and black cable is about $150 uh, on Amazon. But what's nice about that is you do get color coded cables, and typically 10 feet is enough to do. A, battery, a typical battery bank system. So you need to find your wire. You need to find out what gauge wire you're using. So we're using two gauges, uh, two different gauges, not two gauge, two different gauges. We're using a four aught and we're using a six gauge. Uh, it's also called battery cable slash welding wire. Uh, but those two are going to be able to supply all of our uh, circuits in here. We have our power. The chunky ones are the powers coming from the battery, going to the inverter. Um, the air conditioner from Dometic actually uses a four gauge wire, but when you purchase that unit, that is an add-on that you'll need to buy for the Dometic RTX unit. Uh, but it's already designed with a fitting to snap right into it, uh, but it is an additional cost when you're buying the Dometic RTX 2000. But that will go here. So we have only purchased two, the kit that we bought for the Dometic has the four gauge. But the tools that we use here are gonna be able to strip, uh, cut, strip, and crimp, as well as heat shrink, all of the, heat shrink all of those. So once we have our cable, the next thing we need to do is we need to cut our cable. And pair of wire cutters is not gonna cut it, no pun intended, on these wires you're gonna need a specific wire cutter and you need one that has a four aught wire capacity. Uh, you won't believe how big this needs to be to cut something like this. And it may make sense, you know, bigger wire, bigger pliers to cut it. These cable cutters are specifically designed to shear the cable. So it's not like a cut uh, where it's coming down it's kind of like moving in this, like kind of like a shearing action. Um, and that's important because you don't want to fray the end of this wire. If you fray the end of this wire, then uh, it's going to be extremely hard to crimp onto your connections. So we need our wire cutter. So we got our wire, we have our wire cutter. Um, once we've cut our wire, we'll, we need to uh, strip off the, uh, our insulation on the outside. And so this is uh, one of the tools that we use. We'll have that in the description. This one's really nice. It has a little mini blade that you can dial the height of it. And then this just snaps onto the cable, flip it around, and that's going to allow you to take off your ends. Next, you're going to need your your battery lugs, or your ring terminals. These are the ones that if you can get UL listed, it's nice um, because there's a lot of weird name manufacturers on this and this is 
more of a safety item because you're having so much current come through here. Uh, two things, they make a four aught uh, size, but the two differences are one is a 5 16th inch hole and then one is a 3 8 Typical batteries are going to be 5 16th uh, size for the mounting hole. Your shunt, your battery disconnect is going to be of the 3 8 variety. You can find ones that are the 5 16th, but I, with the current that comes out of this, you're probably not going to find something like that. But anyway, you're going to go ahead and get your, uh, your terminals. And then once you get them, you're going to get your hydraulic crimper. Uh, you can get a manual crimper. I like the hydraulic crimper. It gives you just more peace of mind that the connection is very, very strong and robust. So this is one that's on the uh, list as well. They have little interchangeable dies, so you can go from 4 watt to 2 watt to uh, 4 gauge, and then you can go all the way to uh, 6 gauge if necessary. So you're going to need that to do that. So once you've crimped the cable, we're going to move into uh, heat shrink. And you can buy these big rolls of a heat shrink, especially if you're doing a battery bank. It's nice to have, you know, just a big roll so you're not having to continually order stuff. As far as heat shrinking goes, just get a gun, um, just a really cheap gun, heat gun. Uh, you want to do corded. I used to work with cordless guns with battery packs, but battery packs and heat guns don't mix because they, they run, they die really quickly. You need some scissors to uh, cut your heat shrink pair of pliers to undo your bolts so that you can test fit your cable once you have it finished. You know, tape measure to measure everything. Um, calipers. This seems a little overkill, but when you're ordering your heat shrink tape, you need to make sure that the width of your uh, terminal, the heat shrink that you're buying, can fit over your terminal. Um, if you go on Amazon, there's a bunch of different sizes and one size may not be the same as the other, so you really need to check the description because I bought a lot of this stuff and even me, I've found where I ordered one size that I ordered before and uh, the size has changed and it didn't fit. So what I do is I measure this with a pair of calipers, I reference the size chart and then I order that and it seems to work out perfect every time. So once we have all that, the marker is going to, we're going to show you here in just a second. We mark the cable to find out where we need to uh, take off the outer um, cable so that we can access the, uh, the copper. And then there's a little trim tool. Sometimes your cut doesn't go all the way through, so a little X Acto knife helps to kind of clean things up. Um, make sure you have enough terminals. You don't want to order exact size because if you mess up one of your crimps, uh, you're gonna it's just you're gonna have to reorder. You're gonna have to wait. So make sure you have a, at least order an extra bag. Then we have our uh, zip ties. Zip ties are nice because you can hold all the wires in place when you're doing these these routes um, before you cut everything to make sure everything is gonna be where you want it. Uh, and that way, because these are very stiff and it's hard to keep them in place if you're a one-man band trying to put this together. So these assist in holding the cable in one place. And then finally, we just have an Allen wrench. This is just in case we have to move anything out of the way to get access to our cables. Um, this I'm actually using to, uh, you know, tighten up these. Um, so that's pretty much it as far as all the components go. Last part of this video, we're going to dive into uh, doing a little step-by-step -step tutorial on how to cut this and uh, that'll be it for the video. So I um, hope you guys enjoy this next part. If you have any questions, make sure you put those in the description below. They help out the channel a lot. We'll reference that for a future video to answer your questions and uh, yeah, looking forward to your comments. But let's go ahead and jump into our tutorial on how to cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink uh, a 4 aught battery cable. All right, let's kick off this tutorial. Here's all the tools that we talked about. We're gonna do each one step by step. Got a little ahead of myself. I've already stripped this, but I'm gonna show you how to do it anyway. So the first thing we need to do is we need a backup. 
we need to take our tape measure and uh, depending on our battery terminal sizes, so like from here to here, we need to find out how long that's going to be. So the length is going to be where the terminal, or the ring terminal goes over like that and over here. So kind of like that. So the measurement between, if you have a straight shot, you're going to do this and measure from this part of the lug to this part of the lug. So essentially, try to aim for measuring about right here and then right here. Kind of like that halfway point above this little ramp area. Because we want to make sure that from here to here, we have good uh, compression for the uh, wire itself. This extra part is just more insurance that we have a really good connection when we go to do our hydraulic crimp. So from here to here is uh, what you're going to use for your measurements. And then you just kind of want to play around and make sure that if you have a straight shot, that when this goes down to connect the negative bat side of one battery to the negative of the other, it's nice and easy. It's not kinked or twisted. Uh, it's just nice and clean. For my application, I need to make a bend. So I will make sure that when I make my bend, one, that the cable can bend, and two, that after I'm bent and I put it on my terminals, I've got a good connection. So that's the first two things. So once you've got your measurement, the nice thing about doing things the right way is this length of cable needs to be the same for every single battery that you connect in a row so that the power is distributed evenly. So what you can do is you can just have a table here and what I like to do is I'll take a permanent marker and I'll make a reference mark and then I'll get my tape measure out. And for example, these p cable ends that I need or links are 10 inches. So I'll take my tape measure, I'll mark 10 inches. And then now on my workbench, I've got a part where the cable starts and then I got a place where the cable ends. And so what this is gonna do, uh, this is gonna help me to just get my production up a little bit faster. So I'll take the cable, and you guys will be doing something like this. You'll have a long piece of cable. You wanna put it here. It's almost kinda of like cutting a rope. And then when you get to this end piece, you're gonna to wanna to take out your marker. And then you just wanna uh, make a mark right there. Then once you've done it, you wanna do this one at a time. You don't wanna mark and do a bunch of them. Just do this one at a time. Take your cutters, and then sometimes this won't go through, but it's, it's sized so that the cable can go through like this. Um, you can buy a bigger one, but it's not necessary. The cost just goes up. But right where these uh, blades are, you wanna put that there, and then go ahead and take it, and then cut the wire. The nice thing about this specific cutter, as you guys can see, is it has a shearing action so you're going to get this really clean cut uh, because the, you want a clean cut for this next purpose. It's so that this does not fray and you have a hard time you know sticking it into your terminal. So once you've measured, you've cut, and now you have your wire, your next step is you need to strip uh, the outer housing from the wire. So you're going to take this this is our tool on the list. You're going to take this tool. Uh, you'll need to practice dialing this up or down so that it doesn't cut into the copper wire, but it takes uh, away the rubber insulation. So take this. You're going to pop it on. And then what you're going to do is I'm going to try to do this a second time without screwing this up. Uh, but you'll take it, make sure it's together like that, and then take your fingernail and finger, and you want this to be a guide because you're going to rotate this uh, counterclockwise around here. So you're going to take it, and you can kind of see what I'm doing. I'm taking it and I'm rotating it. And then once you get one revolution, you'll, you'll hear a snap. If you hear a snap, then you've probably dialed in perfectly because what you'll have is this clean break. Take your hand, and then you want to hold it and then twist this part of the wire like that. 
And you can see, look at that, you have an, just an incredible clean cut. And if you look in here, notice we don't have any copper filings or pieces of wire because we were just removed the rubber with this tool and we've protected our copper, which is really good. If you accidentally nick one or two little fine wires, that's okay. Don't panic. But if you do like five, like 10, five or 10, you're gonna to want to uh, cut this and then recrimp it. Because remember, this is what's pulling, taking all the current, all the power from your battery system. And the more wires that are gone, the less, the more resistance this is gonna create uh, and it will not be as safe as it could be. So once you have one side done, do the same to the other one, but leave this on, because you're gonna be working over here and hitting this, uh, and it keeps you from messing up and fraying this. The reason you don't wanna fray it is because, look how precise these lugs are. You see that? It's very, very precise. So because it is precise, if it's frayed, it's really hard to get this on here. Next, you want to make sure, uh, take into account the curve. So if you're going over a straight battery to battery connection, this arc is what you want to have. So that when you lay it down, it goes flat. If you have a curved connection like I do, I want to go with the natural curve of the cable. So for me, I'm going to take my terminal and I'm going to turn it down like that. And then I'm going to take it and I'm going to stuff it in here like that. So I get as much wire in there as I, I possibly can. And then what I'm going to do, and I don't do this on both sides, but I'm going to show you guys. I take a marker and I just make a line like that. And that lets me know when I go to crimp it, if I've accidentally moved it, I can visually see that. Because if I moved it, now it's not with the curvature of my wire. It's been offset. So now I can just kind of line it back up. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to take my hydraulic crimper. I'm going to make sure I got the right dies in here. There's multiple dies. They have like 4-aught, 2-aught, 6-gauge. <clears throat> so I have the 4-aught size in here. If there's a metric number, you can convert that to an aught size. And they may have a chart uh, depending on where you bought it from. So this one does, so you can reference it, uh, or you can just ask me what it is. But we're going to take this, we're going to close uh, right here so that we can get pressure from our, uh, when we pump it up. And we're just going to get it very loose, just a loose, tight fitting. Okay, and then when we get there, we'll go ahead and slide it. You can undo this if you've got it too tight, just a little bit like that. And so I just need to open it up again. Okay. It may be hard to see, but I have about that much coming out of the back side, and I have my wire pushed all the way in. All right, so that is what that looks like. I'm gonna hold the wire like this, so my finger's on the gun and this is holding the wire, so it's in the right orientation. I'm gonna put this on the bench, make sure this is tight, and then I'm gonna go for it. And I'm gonna go until I feel a lot of resistance, like right there, I can't go any further. So, I'm gonna take it, don't take it out yet, I wanna check to make sure that my die has compressed. I might get one more push and I can see that my die is completely compressed. So I'm gonna go ahead and release the knob. So when I release the knob, the piston comes back, this falls away. My die stays in there, but my cable is now crimped. Now I was doing this on camera with you guys, so I wasn't paying 100% attention, but if it's offset like this, uh, you won't have to redo it. It's not the end of the world. As you can see, you still have some flex in this wire, but you want to make sure it's as close as possible. So once we have that, you can go ahead and test it. And if you see the cable coming out, don't panic. You're just sliding it down this side. So you can work it back in right there. So it's not actually the cable coming out of your lug. It just seems like that. 
So we kind of just work it back up. And so now we're ready to, we're gonna go ahead and uh, we're gonna heat shrink this side. So you take your heat shrink out, just need a pair of scissors. And so with a marker, I'm gonna show you guys what I measure. So you can always do this. So that line is where I start my heat shrink and then I come back and I try to come back about this. So a little bit shorter than this distance. So it's a little bit longer on this side, a little bit shorter over here. Um, but you really can have it as big as you want. What you don't wanna do is this area right here, you don't want the heat shrink uh, in this area right here. So you don't, you don't want that. This, because this area is your mounting surface for your electrical connection. So anything from here back is okay. So back here is okay. Don't have it on the surface and you kind of can see there. So if you can think about like my pinky is the surface, you want it to be that. You don't want, you don't want the, this making your connection not as good as it can be. Because if this is on, if you're crimping, <laughs> when you go to tighten it down, if you're on top of this plastic, uh, you are not making a good connection and it might be only connecting on this side. So you want this heat shrink to be all the way back right there. So let's take this, we've got this, and let's move this out of the way. So we have it here, and then we're just gonna take it right there. And we're just gonna go ahead and make our cut. All right, so once we've cut it, um, we're gonna open it up. This one does not have the uh, adhesive sealant, which is, uh, that's completely fine. Um, you can have these with adhesive sealant, they'll be more glossy on the inside, but just make sure that if you do have that, um, there's just one extra step and you just wanna make sure that you're heating the heat shrink up enough so that it kinda of oozes out to make that seal. All right, it's gonna get loud. Uh, we'll keep the video rolling, but Go ahead, when you turn your gun on, let it warm up just for a second on high heat. We're gonna come and we're just gonna slowly shrink this until it gets almost all the way around and then we're gonna rotate it to evenly finish the rest out. All right, so I, on pur I purposely made this go a little bit too far so that I can show you if you are heat shrinking and you mess up, you go too close to where your mounting surface is. So say for example, like you have like a washer here. Let's say you had like a mounting washer and that washer was coming in contact with your heat shrink. Uh, what you can do is you don't have to redo your whole heat shrink or fix your wire or anything like that. Just take your X-Acto knife that I was talking to you guys about and you just take your X-Acto knife and just cut that piece of heat shrink so that it is not interfering with your plug. And then once you cut that, you can pull it away and then that makes sure that that is going to be a good connection. So if you have something that's 99% you know, perfect and then you just have a little bit of overhang, it's okay to cut that back so that you have your nice metal to metal contact. But that's how you cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink 
a 4 aught cable that's going to go on your battery terminal. So I hope that helps. If you guys have any question on how to do this, put that in the comments below. Don't forget to check out all these parts that are on the DIY Van Build Cheat Sheet. You can find that link in the description below as well as on vanbuilderhq.com. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you in the next video.